Hey, hey everybody, how are you? This is Elisan, and today I have one of the Spiritual Entrepreneurs member, uh, Bevan, Bevan Bird. So he calls himself Birdify on um, Skype, which is so cute, so cute. But anyway, I met him so many years. I mean, the Spiritual Entrepreneurs, it's like three years old. I met him so many years before, I mean, during then, at the beginning, but we never get to speak somehow. We just miss each other and I suppose you know it's always a divine time for everything and the divine time is now and prior to this conversation was it this week that we actually had a three-hour conversation when you don't talk you don't talk when you talk you can't get off the phone right it's like just so weird and then we're just kind of like connected and he's now on my interview series and then I'm going to be on his next week and so this is just so perfect and if you don't know it's um, I had such a, a little bit of a drama with the spiritual entrepreneurs group. I closed that, I shut in, it was just so much drama. And then now I decided, okay, I'm going to take it more seriously. And that's how we, we reconnected again, right, Vivan? Mm -hmm. And so. Yeah, like you said, divine timing. Yeah. Totally. Like it, when you look at our paths and all that. Mm -hmm. Right. So I want to tell you a little bit about him before I let him tell you about him. But actually, what got me. Um, interested was when he said you know he was actually selling his soul for profits and he was selling his soul um, you know in the corporate world and that gosh that's that that reminded me and I immediately connected with him at that point because I was doing the same you know and um, I was not only doing the same for in job in my job but I was doing it the same in my business as well so I totally knew what he was talking about and so hmm. Why don't you tell us more about you in your own words? Okay. Um, well, like Simon Sinek says, start with why. Yeah. It's really powerful. That's been uh, really helpful lately. Well, hi, I'm Bevan Bird. Like Elise Ant said, I sold my soul before. I worked just for the money, out of alignment with my values of health and joyful living. And I've also done something that I loved, following my excitement and using my natural gifts. And doing that, I felt creative, enthusiastic, and productive all day. And I believe that we're all made of love, and it's our birthright to be well and free and abundant. So I've made it my mission to inspire humanity to be free, abundant, and united. Imagine for a moment a world where no one has to sell their soul to survive, where we all use our gifts, we do what we love, and we live with dignity, loved and respected for being who we truly are. This world is possible. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how I've gotten to, to be where I am. Right. It's that I realized I didn't want to just make profits or make profits for someone else, uh, at the expense of the planet and people's health and, and my own health too. So do you think that making profits is a good thing? Yes. Why? <laughs> well, the reason I think is, I think a lot of us are contradictory, contradictory contradictory can okay, you get my point um this wealth mm -hmm. and profit because most of us are spiritual and i don't know how but the moment i became spiritual the day i became spiritual or rather the day i became i opened my spiritual business which was 10 years ago there's this unspoken lingering aura that says you cannot be rich and spiritual at the same time like even when i was trying to sell my services to my um friends will basically promote my, my services and then they all said you are doing God's work you can't make a profit right so I think that's because this, of a belief yeah, yeah that's right so it's not even for us but it's on the in the on the outside world right like you can't do God's work and then make a profit so therefore for us spiritual people it's it, it's like making a profit it's like evil and then where does that begin and where does this end because you clearly need to Make a profit to survive. So, what do you think about this? About making yeah, you need to make a profit to cover your expenses, right? Like whatever that is. Like for me, say um, rent, food, um, expenses to run the business, right? So that I can keep helping people. So, just at, at a basic level, you need that, right? Mm -hmm. So, how <laughs> um, do you change your mindset then? How do you change yours? And how? I mean, how did you figure that you were selling your soul? Oh, that was because I was um, doing something that wasn't in alignment with my values. So if we go back to when I was surveying back in 2010, um, I, could, I could tell because I was working for a company that works for another company, right? A, a, 
that would, which is bigger. And um, it was pushing farmers around, right? And so it's like they don't care about those people. <laughs> but I do care about the people. So I can tell that I just totally don't, didn't agree with working there. Mm. <clears throat> so was, that, was there a struggle for you then to... Was it, a, was it scary? I mean, it's like you need the money, obviously. Then if you turn your back against them, then how is my going to show up? Were you afraid? Were you scared? Oh, yeah. Well, I still am a bit. Yeah, yeah. What I've done is uh, I quit the surveying job the first time. And so that was my first entrepreneurial venture. So like June 2010. And by probably around March 2011, I had run up 20000 in debt. I didn't have any more credit. So I would either have to be home, homeless or go live with my family because uh, I was living by myself, right? My dad let me stay with him. I lived with him for a year and a half. I got back into things. Like I used the $100 startup a book I, uh, by Chris Gillibo. Mm -hmm. I used that principle of like combining some skills that you have, so surveying and software, to position myself as being more valuable than just the surveyor that I was doing before. And I wasn't trying to get a job in surveying. I was going to create a, a custom software company for surveyors to make their job easier, right? So that's what I reached out to offer to help them like that. And then I got an offer. And see, I, I decided to make $100,000 that year in 20, 2013. This was near the beginning of the year. I, I'd probably never made more than 30 at that point, right? And um, but it worked though. So when I got this job offer, I was like, I'll, I'll take it. Now that was still like still going in like against my values. But this way, I could pay all my debt back, and then you know reinvest in myself again and start more intelligently again on the entrepreneurial path. Uh, then, so then I worked at the second company at a higher rate of pay, right? Uh, over double. I worked from that 2013 till the end of 2016. When I got like quite sick and I was lying in bed, like I couldn't do anything, uh, and I well I couldn't really do much. And a doctor said I had pneumonia, and then I I quit. After that, I quit that job. Um, so that was the second time. And then they offered me to do continue doing office work because I did field work and office. So it's like at first I said no, and I don't know if I said no twice or once. Then I said maybe, like I'll consider it. I thought about it. And then I was like, hmm, that might be good because the first time I tried this, it didn't work out too well. I didn't make enough money quick enough. And it's probably because of beliefs like you've been pointing out, you know, and in our conversation before. So I'm still working on that. And now we're working on it collaboratively mm. in a group. I'm doing these mastermind groups and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, basically, then I just I, I said, hey, that would actually be all right. I'll compromise a bit on that and do the office work. Then I don't have to do the field work. So I'm not really selling my health so much anymore because I'm not in industrial sites, right? Just It's just remotely. They send me the data. I make a report or I make a program to make the report faster. So that's all right because uh, that's like being a, it's like an instant ticket to being a digital nomad because you can do it from anywhere. So already doing the work from home anyway. So then I just did that. I'm like, uh, I made a change, right? I decided to totally change it. So I got rid of the, um, well, I, actually, I can tell that story as, a, as another story, which I wrote a couple days ago, which is about getting closer to, to nature, right? Which is near and dear to my heart. So I can just tell you this, and then you'll hear it in there. <clears throat> so um, like my dad, I believe that humans are a part of nature. When I was four years old, uh, we spent the winter camping all over Mexico, and, uh, and I really loved it. There's a lot of stories I can tell about that. Um, in 2016, I started getting sick, right? Like I told you, in the, in the city I lived in, in Vancouver, Canada, and I had pneumonia. And I wanted to get closer to nature, and I wanted to be healthy again. And I, so I made a change. I quit my job, and I let go of my apartment. See, I had partly the reason I got sick was because of stress. And also not getting much exercise and not much sunlight either because it's just raining and like terrible weather. <laughs> and I don't really like going to a gym, but I like but to be outside it in nature. It's like, mm. I think when, I think I've, I, I mean, I've observed so many people, they ignore, they ignore, they ignore. It is the last yeah. straw is their body breaks down. Totally. That's what happened to me there. And so I had to make another change. <laughs> yeah. Because the health is really scary, right? You, if you think if you have no money, it's scary. Wait till the health breaks down. It's even scarier than no money. 
Hmm. It's interesting too that I was make, kind of taking a bit of a step in my business too, because I had just um, I found a way to connect with people online, and it and it worked really well. I learned it from someone, and it's something I've been practicing for years. And then uh, so I booked, uh, I got these people to book who are quite influential, like in the top thirty on uh, globalgurus.com uh, dot org on certain topics like internet marketing or sales. Um, and so they booked into my calendar first thing Monday morning, like the earliest possible time. So I'm like, that, this must mean something. It must be working pretty well. And I made a training on how I did that. And then I offered the training and on Facebook. People wanted it, right? So I'm like, okay, that's good. I, I said, this is a $500 training. Like, check, you know, check it out. Like, do you want it, right? Five or 10 people wanted it. So I made this page to automate it, right? So I started making the, the funnel and I made a, a video to put on that landing page. And then... I, I was starting to create that thing in simpler and then literally that next day I'm like bad sick. <laughs> so maybe it could have been that I had a belief that stopped me from getting to another level. I'm not sure like exactly because there's multiple factors that went into it, into, into getting sick at that point. Yeah. Anyway, it's interesting though. Yeah, <clears throat> that's true. It's either, mm-hmm. yeah, so, something must have, sab- a belief system must have sabotaged you. Otherwise, why would you fall sick? Like, you like, you resisted it so bad. Yeah, right? that I couldn't make the funnel. And so I told them, like, I asked for a rain check on, on the offer. <laughs> so that's the fear. Because I was there. so sick. Yeah, that's yeah. the fear. I think it's usually fear that brings us down. So you have to figure out what are you really afraid of? What's that fear? I mean, I can totally understand. I mean, I, I think fear yeah. is not. I believe fear is not real, but when you're facing fear, it can be so real, you know, that you, if you're not aware, then you get sucked into the story. I mean, for me, I've been spiritual, a spiritual son for 10 years, and you might think, oh, you know, it's, you might get used to it, you do the routines, but despite doing the routines, there is fear in between the routines. You know, so fear is so sneaky until you. Yeah, live. like maybe late late at night. Like for me, sometimes it's not every day, but certain days it might be after eating a bunch of meat or eating late or something. But sometimes then I'm just up late and I can't fall asleep, and then for some reason I'm scared. I yeah. don't know why. So that's yeah. the fear, and I usually get that as well. So, you know, recently because I had so much fear. And it was just driving me crazy, like ridiculous fear because I want to do a podcast. And then it drove me with so much stress, right? And then I woke up in the middle of the night thinking about it as when I thought it's logical to think about it because it's about business, right? So you got you get sucked into the, to the story that you should think about it because it is business and you must think about your business, not at three o'clock in the morning, right? So I decided this is absolutely ridiculous. And I asked myself, do I really want to engage in this conversation in my head at, th- at this time? And I said, no, I don't. I, then what do I want to do? I want to sleep. And you know, Pavan, this is so interesting. And it's actually so easy when you actually state what you want, the thought leaves. And then you go to the bed. And then you think about it the next day. And it's like going back to your feeling. Is this thought out? What is this thought generated out of? Fear or love? If it's fear, then it's not real. God didn't create this fear. So why did you create this fear, right? It's out of ego. Mm-hmm. So and yeah. then you kind of like have to have your, your own conversation to trace it back. Oh, this is ego. And then do you want to engage in this? And this, is this even real? Then you kind of like have to self-soothe yourself and to say, oh, this mm-hmm. is absolutely ridiculous. So going back to this oh, sales yeah. page, right? I think you need to go really deep into what's that fear. Otherwise, it might just happen again. But you're yeah, right. It could be. If you have said that, then it could be the belief system that you are afraid of the money. It's not, you, you're not afraid of not having the money because actually most of us are so used to not having the money that it becomes comfortable, uncomfortable. It's part of the comfort yeah. zone. And having yeah. money is not comfortable, even though we want it. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's a self-sabotage. You're right about mm-hmm. that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's very insightful. Thank you. Or um, the, the sale, or the you know, the sales funnel was just causing you too much stress. <laughs> I don't know. Could be, or it's just a fear of scaling. You know, because yeah, because it was like a scaling thing. Like when I was doing it person to person, it was all right. But if you automate something, it can. There's no limit to how big it could go. Right. So it could be fear of like having certain size, a certain yeah. size audience. Yeah, yeah, that could be it. Yeah, well, I'll I'll figure it out. Anyway, we we've continued to grow since then. Um, so it, yeah, at that time, basically that was the major change, right? Quitting the job, 
letting go of the apartment and moving my stuff into storage so I could just go wherever I wanted to rather than being stuck there and worrying about how to pay the bills when I wasn't really making that much money yet. Um, and the work that I was doing, remember the, the surveying, it was kind of like off and on, it fluctuated. So I, I stressed out about it sometimes. Okay. So then on the uh, New Year's Eve of 2016, like basically the end of 2016, I flew to Puerto Vallarta and like saw the New Year's, New Year's Eve party here. And then I spent the next five and a half months in, in Mexico at this peaceful and beautiful beach town where I am right now. There's tons of videos I've been posting of it. Um, and so I was swimming, hiking, bodyboarding almost every day. And instead of being 26 floors up and surrounded by traffic noise, I could now just walk out my back door right there, uh, walk down the steps and then feel the grass with my bare feet. And I, I did yoga in, in the backyard and stuff. It's great. It's just a 10 minute and the jungle is right there too, which I can see. Uh, and it's just a 10 minute walk down to the beach and it has some of the softest feeling sand that I've ever felt. It's, it's like, it's like a spa for your feet. It's glorious. Um, and then, uh, when I returned to Canada in June, I stayed with my dad for the summer. Um, and I camped on his land, which was even closer than to nature than I was living here in Mexico. Something special about sleeping in a hammock, um, under the stars with the fir trees and boulders, tons of boulders there too. Um, also this summer, I went to the Million Dollar Strategic Alliance Summit uh, in Scottsdale, Arizona. This was really awesome. I, I won that by doing a promotion earlier in the year while I was here. So this was really cool because I'm pretty sure that this may be an international speaker by winning a, a thing where I could speak to the whole group. And 60% uh, of the audience said they wanted to do a deal with me, like create alliances. So that was really awesome. Oh, yeah. Then, then I became a number one uh, best-selling author on Amazon with with Dana Zaraconi of SourceYourJoy.com and and Your Shift Matters. Uh, and then yeah, then I came back here mid October uh, for the next six months. So so I'm glad I made the change. Health's on the rise, and nature is inspiring. Its vibration is perfect. It's it's peaceful and it helps us become more resourceful and creative and and uh, intelligent. To see, too many of us have become addicted to technological distraction with the, the devices and social media. And so this is why I encourage people to get out in nature more often and cease the mental chatter and receive an immense inspiration. Like Einstein said, when you look deep into nature, you'll understand everything better. So what was your so, shift, right? Like you were in debt mm. and what was that shift? Oh, not feeling guilty about being in debt anymore. Mm. Yeah, that was sometime in 2012 or, or 2013. So what is one practical step? Because a lot of people are in debt. I think it's emotional. It's mm -hmm. not, And they know they don't want to, then they get used to it. So I think I've been in debt for 10 years and I cleared it, right? But it was in debt, out of debt, in debt, out of debt. So I think it was a habit. So what is this one strategy that you can tell people to finally get out on it i don't know if i'm qualified for that i mean i'm gonna interview renny gabriel soon who who has wealth on any income.com so so he'll share that and so we can refer to that interview well, you have your uh, own but, but i'll say experience, right your but own I'll, I'll say from experience. from my story yeah but see i didn't have like a big pattern of debt though um but i'll say i guess twenty thousand basically is quite huge. yeah it was about 22 or so yeah. it was around there yeah um, well, I felt bad about it and like felt like maybe I let some people down. And so that was like crushing me. And so later, so at a point I just stopped letting that bother me. Remember I was staying with my dad, like in the forest. So we were close to nature and that made me more, more resourceful being there and just having his influence as well. And like, I knew that he cared about me, um, cause he would just provide for me. Right. And then later I added it up and I was like, Okay, and then uh, then I paid him. Like once I once I actually got that six figure job, I made a, over a, like one hundred forty six thousand in twenty thirteen. So, 2013. what was the gap between? So I, what was the gap between that time and you got it, getting your six figure job? What was that time period? Do you know? Can you remember? The time between which? Which you got yourself in debt, and then. Oh right. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, the debt. I was getting myself in debt basically sometime around the summer of 2010. Um, and 
the 20,000 was like by when I got evicted from my place in Vancouver in around March, I think 2011. Right. So that's when I had 22,000 of debt. And then. So you incurred um, that in the, within a year, so to speak. Yeah. In less. Okay. Less. Yeah. Okay. So then by, um, the end, near the end of 2012, I was, that's where I was shifting it and turning it around or maybe even the beginning of 2013. Like there was an article, um, which is like by Napoleon Hill and, uh, Andrew Carnegie. And I just like a friend emailed it to me and he, and, and this guy was like a mentor of, me, of a mentor of mine, or he forwarded it and it went down. It, like in, I used to be in an MLM. So it was like that. Right. But I don't do, really do that anymore. Anyway, it was good that we had those connections because that really helped me a lot. And like they said, take this, uh, this to heart, right? Passing that message on and I did it. I took it to heart. And now I'm doing that same thing again, like with this little, this little kind of statement thing of like, you know, exactly what you want and what you're going to give to get it. So it's super simple. And it's like focus on this one thing, like this mm. plan. And I did that. Um, and so, like said, I'd make custom software for surveyors. So I combined that article of like, you know, Napoleon Hill and Andrew Carnegie's theory or like idea really uh, with, with a um, hundred dollars startup by Chris Gillibo and my skills surveying software and just started to do that. So from then 2012 to when did you get your six figure job then? And, and I should say that w once I got that article and once I started applying that thing and like putting this thing in and then reading it 12 times a day and then, you know, with feeling and then taking action every time I read it as much as possible in, in case, unless I couldn't take action, like we're driving and I just said it, but we couldn't take action yet. Anyway, um, I think it took about three weeks that then I got this, this job. Uh, so I wasn't trying to get a job, but I took it because my goal was to make a hundred thousand this year. And so when they offered something that he said, at least 40, at least $40 an hour. So I knew that means about a hundred thousand. So I just took it. So when, how long was that for you? That shift? Three, for oh, well, it was three, three weeks. Once I started doing it, like with the article, I mean, applying what it said, yeah, it was three weeks to, to get into that job. Mm. So it was actually not yeah, that was great. So why do you think people get stuck? Why do you think they allow themselves to get stuck? Why did you allow yourself to get stuck? Getting stuck in debt, you mean? Like just stuck. Oh, well, I was scared. Back, you mean getting in debt in the first place, if that's what you mean, like not selling enough quick enough, it was fear and like staying in the comfort zone, like not going out and like doing public speaking or whatever, right? Not doing what would be really effective, just not being that productive and doing the things I knew that would really work because it was way out of my comfort zone. I wasn't used to doing it. And you have to change all, all these habits from what I used to do. Mm. So I think most people, including myself, it's like it the universe would drive you up the wall and then you have no choice but to make but along the way you kind of like have opportunities but then it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't like pushing people enough or it wasn't pushing me enough because you're still in the comfort zone till like she hits the fan you have no choice then it's such a quick turnaround for you it's like three weeks quick turnaround <laughs> oh but i yeah but i wasn't under pressure there then anymore this was just when I kind of like decided to do it a new way. Also, uh, a friend of mine that I'd met in, in around the early 2011 um, at a social media event that was like a free thing on, on Saturday. But he was there and this guy was a self-made millionaire mm. connected with him. I mean, like me, me and him and the organizer, like trainer, we had lunch after that. Right. And so we connected. Right. I stayed in touch with him. I talked with him on the phone and he uh, he told uh, so I asked him questions and listened for like half an hour. He told me what he wanted to do. So that builds the relationship, right? And trust. And then there was reciprocity because like in the future when I was in a bunch of debt and I couldn't really see like a greater vision for myself, but he held that vision and inspired me. Yeah, he got you know, me to, you... to visualize it. So that was the shift point is like where he, where he did that. He did like a guided meditation for me. Uh, we were in the parking lot of the, of the grocery store in town me and my dad. And so he, that guy guided me through it on the phone. And then after that, like I got that article, I don't know which one happened first, but then see, I just went and applied it. Yeah. You made a point on when you are so in the darkness, you can't see a light out. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't. And I wasn't seeing like a greater vision for myself, like a compelling vision. Right. But that's really important because 
whatever we think about most of the time, believingly, is what we end up becoming. We become what we think about, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You got to have a compelling vision that pulls you. It's got to be beautiful. It's got to inspire you. He helped me with that. He just suggested things like having a hundred thousand in the bank and having all these clients and like loving working with them and going on cruises and stuff like that. So he gave me movies to play in my head. He was mm. suggesting them. Mm. But like in real time, we, we did that. Mm. Mm. That's such a good tip. So you can change your life around by just thinking and holding on to that vision. That's the starting place. Yeah. Yeah. Imagination. Yeah. <laughs> the power of your unlimited imagination. Yes. Like Neville Goddard wrote about. Yes. Mm. Yes. That's the shifting point. Totally. Because we have to imagine it. Because whatever you imagine, you can create. Yeah. So what tips do you have for people who now realize that, I think a lot of people know that they are selling their souls for money, right? Yeah. But then, people are messaging me about that. Yeah. Then what is the next step? Because oh, there yeah. are we, bills we to have be to. We got to own our value. Well, sometimes there's a transition point where period where you may be doing two jobs or you might go through the desert a bit, as some say, where you uh, you have to give things up. Right. You, you live more simply or you do a combination or something. Right. You might do two jobs for a while. I'm doing that now. So like with that surveying job where I just do office stuff, normally there was no work. Now, right now, there's two jobs for that. But also I do all my stuff with the masterminds and stuff like that and joint venture brokering. Uh, things that I love to do, like talking with people and inspiring them. Uh, but that's great because now I'm transitioning and doing what I love more and more of the time. Mm. So when you actually got your six-figure job, were you still selling your soul then even though it was a good paying job? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. But yeah. you know why yeah, you that had time, to get the job, in 2013, right? uh, I didn't have to, but I thought that's an easy way to make the 100000 Right. Because like, it, I could do it in different ways. And so I was going to make the software company, but I thought this is easier. I'll just do it or mm -hmm. I'll go for it, right? Right. Um, but I didn't answer your question though, right? Because I think you were saying like, how do you, do you know the one you asked me like a question one or two ago? Um, so I asked you how. So when people know that they 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 are selling their soul for money, what do they do now? Right. So you are saying that. Right. Yeah, I wanted to explain that more because right? we yeah. didn't we didn't follow. We, yeah, I didn't complete that because you need to value who you are. Right. We need to be ourselves. We have to know ourselves. It may take um, collaborating with other people to find out who you are because we have gifts within us that we may not even see. Like right from when we were a baby, and we might think everyone has those gifts but then they don't. We're unique. So we have to find out how we're different or why we're different from other people and what drives us. The why thing is really powerful. What's something that makes you cry? Like if you, if you think about it as like something that's compelling or inspiring for you to do to change the world or make people's lives better in some way. But like when you think about it, it makes you cry because it's so, you're so passionate about it. You care so much. Then that's a good thing. Yeah. Because that could be your, your why, right? So let me ask you a question. Do you believe your gifts and talents are intertwined with your soul purpose? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. So if, you, if one knows their gifts and talents, does that mean they know what their soul is longing for? Or if they know what their soul purpose is, they know what their gifts and talents are? Maybe. I'd say no, not necessarily. <laughs> but like, I know that definitely like our purpose is joy, right? It's like to enjoy life and to learn and love and all that, right? Be, follow your excitement. So if you, if you see what you love to do or what you're great at, um, but love what you love to do is probably better in a way. If you just want to make money, it's like what you're great at or good at talent, right? If you're, if it's what you love, then that's going to be even better long term. But it may take longer for it to ramp up to paying you, right? Mm. I think <laughs> um, Stephen Harvey was Stephen Harvey was saying there's a difference between talents and a gift. You can be a ta you can be talented in accounting, but that doesn't mean that you're gifted in accounting. Something like that. Okay, sure. 
Um, well, there's a thing called um, Sacred Gifts. So there's a program, Discover Your Sacred Gifts. And in that, she says there's 24 of them, and you probably have four or five. So like, I think I have the ones of uh, encouragement, which means you can encourage people and you can see their potential. So encourage them into fulfilling that potential. And uh, teaching and knowledge and wisdom. I don't know if I remember what the other one was, or maybe those are the ones I have. So, um, but that means we also don't have a bunch of them, but it's good to know about them because you can spot them in other people too. Uh, and that's all good for collaborating and team building because you, you get the complementary things. Which goes back to, you know, fundamentally knowing who you are. It takes time to know who you are. I mean, yeah. it doesn't matter if today you don't know what your gifts are or you might suspect this is your talent. It doesn't matter. But if you decide you're going to figure that out, then the yeah. universe always answers the call. Answers yeah, your, definitely you answer ask, the call. Yeah. Yeah. Ask what your purpose is. Ask what your greatest gifts are. Yeah. And, and like prepare to be shown. And um, like every day, spend some time with yourself. Like yeah. maybe go for a walk in nature if you can in the morning. That yeah. would be really good. I think before you get into things you have to do. Yeah. Put some extra time in the morning. Yeah. I think city people don't spend enough time with themselves because they're all rushing, rushing, rushing. And I was just reading yeah. the book yesterday and it says, Be still and know that I am God. So Oh yeah, yeah, that's so powerful. Yeah. yeah it's like people otherwise you become walk, literally zombies. Human yeah. zombies walking around doing the same shit yeah. different day and it's just so you, sad. you nailed it. When you're busy and you just keep yourself busy, that's what slows down maybe spiritual development or like knowing yourself. It just makes it way, way take way longer. Um, but when I lived in Vancouver at that, you know, on the 26th floor there in Cole Harbor, I was just a few blocks away from Stanley Park. Like wherever I positioned myself, I was always close to the place I was before that. It was a few blocks away from Pacific Spirit National Park, which is a huge park in like the UBC, UBC area. Uh, and so downtown there, that's like a big park dedicated and it stays as park in Vancouver. And it's one of the best parks in the world. I think it's huge and amazing. So I was out there like every day. Mm, yeah. So, all right. City people just spend 10 minutes trying to, I mean, yeah, I mean, another first you thing, try. Yeah. Another thing you can do though, because if you, if you can't even get into nature, it's okay because you can get things where you can listen to it in, in your headphones, listen to nature sounds and just do a meditation for like yeah. 20 minutes. If you give yourself that time every day, then that's going to make you way more peaceful. Yeah. Like it'll give you peace of mind and then you can receive and like get more intuition and yeah. wisdom and stuff. Be more creative. Most city people tell you they don't have time. And Deepak Chopra will say, if you think you don't have time, then you are the one who needs to do more meditation. Do it twice. So I think this is the this is the this is the slyness of the ego, you know? They will the ego will convince you you don't need it, you're at peace now. But then if you have these thoughts, then the more you should do it. Because once you do it, I promise you, you don't want to get out. If you are doing it right, you don't want to get out actually. So you actually find your peace. And remember the ego doesn't want you to find peace so that it can exist and it, continu and it uh, can continue to feed into you. Oh yeah. Yeah, you're right. When you're doing it right, like once you're meditating or you're just, you just let everything go, let all the thoughts go and just relax or even in nature, but even just in your room, right? With quiet, no one distracting you. Um, yeah, then you can get to a place of like bliss yeah. where you don't want to come out of it. You really love the feeling of it. And it's so peaceful. And then from there, you can get great ideas. They'll just pop into your head. Yeah. Which you can then use, right, in your business and to do things more productively, more profitably and all that. Yeah, that's so true. So thank you so much, Bevan, for your time. Where can people find you and collaborate with you? All right. Thank you. Uh, well, a couple places, I guess. Um, and you can search for me on social media, like Facebook, uh, check out the videos and um, follow along. If you want to follow along every day, check out the videos on YouTube, um, soul to soul connector.com. That's my main website. Cause that's like what I do at connect. I, I, I um, accelerate positive impact, like us all awakening on the planet and uniting and stuff like that. Um, and also soul to soul talks.com. I'm going to be hosting Elise and on there and I'm looking forward to doing that. And that's a brand new platform right now, just starting. But uh, it, it's it's a platform to help you live your dreams. Awesome, yeah. awesome. So those of you who want to accelerate your influence, <laughs> you should uh, talk 
to Bavan. Absolutely. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, there isn't like too small or big of an influence that he cannot help you, right? Because I think some people think, oh, but I'm so small. You know, how can I, how can I play this game? But then that's where you're oh, wrong. Yeah, that's, where yeah, you're that's wrong. okay. You can still reach out to me. Because yeah. as, as we grow and I build a team, then, you know, my assistants will help those people too. So we can definitely, no matter what, yeah, definitely yeah. send a message. If you have that thought, that is for sure from the ego. So yeah. don't buy into yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. I've noticed that I had that too. Yeah. Um, sorry for like, you know, extending it, but it's, that's like a really big thing because I've noticed it's actually very easy to get people onto your show. Like you can reach out. So don't be scared to reach out to people who are more influential than you or like way more. Don't worry about it. I've interviewed Bob Berg and that, that was very easy. Um, <laughs> and there's going to be a whole lot more. Yeah. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So remember this in the course of miracles, it also says that, you know, God doesn't want you to be in awe of your brothers because we're all created the same. You know, if you're in awe of your brother, means you see that he's better than you, which is also from the ego, which is not the, not true because we're all created equally. And so yeah. you want to respect one another, but not in awe of one another. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe awe, it's okay. Like I, I call it a namaste attitude. So the light in me honors the light in you. Uh, but that is an equal thing. So you can be in awe, but what I'd say is don't idolize. Definitely yeah, don't idolize someone. Yeah, I think that's what, what they mean is idolize. Awe, it's like you're, you're, you're jealous of someone, you you feel like they are better, you're idolizing. So I think that's what the book don't, means. Okay, yeah, definitely don't do that. Yeah, because we're all the same. All right. <laughs> all righty, yeah. so thank you so much for your time. You know where to find him. I'll leave the links on, you know, on this page, and we'll talk to you very soon again. Take care. Mm. Goodbye. Bye-bye.